Um, if you want to prepare yourselves, your hearts for Resurrection Sunday, I want to recommend to you that you spend some time reading and reflecting in the Gospel of Luke. Luke is a very unique expression of the good news, the story, the life of Jesus, because perhaps it has more detail. Um, some say different detail, but I would say more detail. If you want to really get a glimpse at what he was all about, Luke is a great place to jump in. Um, each of the Gospels is unique. Let me give you a little bit of Bible study. Matthew writes from the perspective uh, of a Jewish person to a Jewish audience. It is his goal, his aim, um, to, 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 to show Jesus through the lens of being the Messiah, uh, the King of Israel. Uh, it is his, his, his uh, intent to show that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah and that he is uh, not, only, not only Israel's king, but he is the king of God's kingdom. Is this making sense to you? He's trying to, Matthew wants you to see uh, him in all of his Jewishness. Mark wants you to see him as the, uh, the servant of God. As you read through the gospel of Mark, Mark will move quickly, and this happened, and that happened, and then he was here, and then he was there, but he shows all of these uh, sort of acts of servitude because Mark is writing to a Roman audience where perhaps three-fifths of the people were servants or slaves. Mark wants us to understand that the God we serve, the Jesus we call on, uh, is the one who's, who's not only the servant son of God, but he's the servant son of man sent to serve humanity. Am I making sense yet? If you read the Gospel of John, what you will discover is John wrote um, considering a universal um, uh, humanity, that Jesus was sent um, to all the world. And so we read in John chapter 3, for God so loved the that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, no matter whoever, no matter wherever, no matter whatever they've done, no matter how far from God they've been, you don't have to be religious, you don't have to have a Jewish background, you don't have to have a, a church background, come on, help me preach somebody. Uh, you can be Jewish, Muslim, you can be anti-Semitic, you can be uh, agnostic, you can be atheist, and when you come in contact with Jesus, he says Jesus can save you, he can forgive you, he can deliver you, he can bring you into the fullness of relationship with God in such a way that your life will be transformed for the rest of eternity. Is that the gospel that you believe? Luke is a historian and a physician, and so he tends to write with detail. And his, his, his one aim is to write to a Greek-speaking audience largely, uh, though, though his gospel would be read by people all over the world. He writes to them, and he wants them to know that this dude is the real deal. He is the quintessential human being. If you ever want to know what humanity is supposed to look like, look no further than the Son of Man. He will tell us that he came with a very specific purpose, which was to seek and to save the lost. And so whatever you want to understand about him, you need to know, Luke says, that he came to save lost people. Tell your neighbor, he came to save lost people. Ask your neighbor, is you lost? Wait for an answer. Is you lost? We up in here, and I promise you, I don't care how many people are in church and online, there's always somebody lost. That's not a put down, that's not a denigration, that is a reality. I once was lost. I'm th thank God I'm found. Anybody glad they got found? Come on, somebody. You remember what it was like when you were lost? How jacked you were when you were lost? Somebody's like, I'm still jacked. No, you're not nearly as jacked now as you were when you were lost. I feel the anointing right there. I'm not nearly as jacked now as I was before I came to know Christ. Jesus has the power to transform our lives. Listen now, and he not only transforms our lives on the outside, which is where we like to begin, but he begins a work of transforming us down on the inside. Anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? Am I happy by myself? Um, if, if you don't know what it means to be changed on the inside, where he starts changing your motivations and changing your thought patterns, changing how you move when stuff tempts you, I'm going to come to somebody's road just as soon as I can. 
Have you, have you seen how Jesus will give you a, 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 a like for new things and a dislike for old things? That's what he does when he changes you from the inside. It all begins when he forgives you and me of our sin. And, and I got to talk about this for a moment because I think in church we've gotten so smug with the Lord that we forgot what it means to be forgiven. Like, I, I'm, I'm good. I don't need no forgiveness in my life. Are you serious? I'm saved. I need forgiveness. I, that, that's why the Lord says, confess your sins one to another. He says, if you confess your sins, 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, um, what does he say? Uh, he is faithful to forgive us, right? He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus is in the business of starting on the inside. Tell your neighbor he starts on the inside. In this text that we're reading today, um, Luke guides us, if you will, through the story of a, paral a paralyzed man. This man is stuck. Somebody say he's stuck. And um, he's trying to help us see that Jesus is the, is the one uh, who responds to the faith of stuck people. <sighs> Has anybody ever been stuck in life? Um, we, 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 think, we think paralysis of analysis. We think um, we, we get stuck um, in our heads. Anybody ever got stuck in your head besides me? Uh, we get stuck in our patterns. We get stuck in our ways. We get stuck in our bad habits. We get stuck in bad relationships. We, we, we get stuck doing things we know we had no business doing, and we knew we had no business doing before we started doing it. And you ever been in a place where you're like, why am I doing this again? Stuck. The text opens up. One day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and of Judea and Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. The NIV says to heal the sick. The New King James Version says the power of the Lord was there to heal them. Another translation says and the power of the Lord was there to heal. And I wonder if it wasn't all of that, that it was there to heal the sick, but it was also there to heal the Pharisees and the Sadducees who came from a long ways to check Jesus out. Now, the Pharisees and the the, I said the Sadducees, but it's the teachers of the law, the experts in the law. These were the quintessential religionists. They were the power brokers in the community. They were the ones who spent their time studying the law of God and trying to make sure that the people followed the law of God. The problem is that they got so into the details and the, um, uh, the fineries of the law that they came up with so many laws and rules that they made people miserable. Have y'all been around church that makes you miserable? Well, don't do this and don't do that. And women don't wear no makeup. And baby, that's that. And where's your tie? You don't have on a tie? And we, I grew up in a, in a setting where you couldn't even go to the beach on Sunday because that was a sin. I was trying to get out of there as fast as I could. I wanted salvation, but I didn't want to be miserable. Come on, help me preach somebody. Th this was their pattern. And Luke points out that Jesus, is in the, he's in somebody's house. Most people think it is in Peter's house, and he's teaching. And while he's teaching, these religionists show up, and they show up. And you would think they would show up to say, this something's going on. God is up to something. The kingdom is moving. They show up, and they're like, Just sitting is what he says. Did y'all notice that in your Bible? He says, uh, and, and uh, verse 17, one day Jesus was teaching and the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. Somebody said they were sitting there. They were sitting there. Now, there's nothing wrong with sitting because sitting can be a very neutral posture. In fact, in that day and time, teachers would sit in order to teach. 
If I was sitting on my stool, I would be in an appropriate place as a teacher, teaching the congregation, and the people in the house were also sitting. But he only mentions, Luke only mentions this particular detail concerning the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that they're sitting. He's not so concerned with the position of their bodies as he is the posture of their hearts. Jesus is throwing, Jesus is, is, is having a meeting and he's teaching in the room. The religionists, the Pharisees, they walk in and they come sit down and they got some stuff going on inside of them. Not everybody who comes to church comes the same way. Are y'all following me? Just because I came to church doesn't mean I came open to what church had to offer me, to what the Lord wants to do in my life, to the change that he wants to bring about in my life. It doesn't mean that I'm necessarily, how many, some of, don't raise your hand, some of y'all got dragged up in here today. Some of y'all sitting online, you're like, I don't, I'm really not feeling this, I don't want to be sitting here, I would rather be getting my extra hour of sleep or finishing my breakfast, but my wife said if I don't, if I watch this service, it ain't going to go well for me later today. I don't know. He's, he's saying they're, they're sitting, and, and come with me down to, oh, let's see, right about verse 21. They're watching these events happen, and they watch these, these men bring in this guy. We're going to get to him in a moment. They bring in this guy on a mat, on a cot. And when they bring him in, they finally get him in. We'll talk about how they got him in. Um, Jesus says to the man, your sins are forgiven. And they go, who does brother think he is? Go tell somebody they can be forgiven. You would think that having studied the law of Moses with detail, they'd be happy that somebody could be forgiven. But there's some folk who don't want nobody to be forgiven except them. Somebody help me preach up in here. Isn't it amazing how, how, how some people can be so into the Word of God, into the, the, the details of the Word of God, that, they, that they, they can't even see the compassion of the Word of God. And it says that these, these Pharisees, they come and they're sitting and they're negative Nellies and they're contentious because they don't really care about the larger kingdom agenda of God. They, they don't want their power to be diminished. They don't want their influence to be diminished. What they're comfortable doing is sitting. And it's what I call sitting faith. There's a type of faith in the church that is sitting faith. Sitting faith that looks at everything skeptically. S sitting faith that ain't going to do nothing. Sitting faith, listen, that can divide the word of God down to a T but setting faith that is critical. They, listen, these cats ain't bring nobody to church. Did y'all see these guys? Ooh, it got quiet in here, I'm sorry. Was that a nerve? I'm just, I don't know where I, where I am. They, they, they're, they're in church, but they're critical of somebody being forgiven, and they can't, they, they, said, listen, they didn't even acknowledge that the man was brought on a cot, that the man was paralyzed, that the man was stuck. They just... And what I pray for, for, for us is that we would break a sitting spirit off of us. That the kind of, the kind of attitude about the things of God and about what God is doing, um, where, where, where we diminish the great things that he is doing and, and, and we just keep looking for, is everything perfect? Is this making sense? They had sitting faith. Um, they didn't have, it says, the Bible says that, that the power of the Lord was there to heal. And I wonder what God would have healed them of had their faith posture been different. What could God heal you of if you would trust him? What could God change if you and I would believe him? What, what miracle could we see God do 
if we would have something more than sitting faith. Can I talk to you about another kind of faith in this text? There's a carrying faith. I, I call it carrying faith. Because the Bible says um, that there's some men, verse 18, they come carrying a paralyzed man on a mat, on a cot, and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees got sitting faith. They ain't going to do nothing for nobody. They're not going to help nobody. They ain't going to bring nobody to the house of the Lord. Come on, help me talk somebody. But these men, these men don't get a name. They don't got a title. They don't have degrees. Nobody knows them. The only way they ever come up in the Bible is they're the guys who carry the paralytic. That's all they get. And Jesus, the Bible says, and Jesus sees their faith. Uh, newsflash, the God we serve sees and responds to faith. Ask your neighbor, how's your faith today? He sees their faith. Now, what kind of faith does it take to take a dude who is paralyzed, put him on a cot, and march him through the hot Palestinian sun until you get to the destination where Jesus is? Listen now. I don't know if the man was 140 pounds, 180 pounds, 220. I have no idea. All I know is trying to carry a dude who can't move is a lot of work. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of coordinating. Are you following what I'm saying? This is what carrying faith does. It exerts a lot of energy. It, it goes the distance. Y'all not going to help me preach up in here. It, it, listen, it carries the burden when the burden ain't yours. I feel the anointing happening. It cares so much about the person getting to the presence of the Lord that they're willing to do whatever it takes to get them there, even if it means that they got a sweat on the way, they ain't got no help. Hey, listen, this ain't no air mattress on wheels. This is a little cop with a big old dude on it, and they are marching and trudging and carrying him. Listen, they get to the crib, and the crowd won't let him in. Now, I didn't think about this crowd, but, but, it, but, it, but it makes me wonder, like, what kind of crowd is here? Y'all see these dudes carrying this man? Y'all see these dudes carrying this dude, they dripping sweat. Ain't, no ain't nobody in the crowd say, you want some water? Ain't nobody in the crowd say, you want my seat? Ain't nobody in the crowd say, come on in. Nobody in the crowd say, let's, let's get him before the Lord. No, you, you take the front row. Y'all you tracking with me? This is an interesting crowd. Um, but this, this, this crew of guys demonstrate faith by carrying someone else to the presence of the Lord. When they couldn't get him in, I want you to see their determination because the Bible says they go up the stairs on the side of the house. Now, can you imagine with me four dudes carrying a dude on a cot trying to go up a set of stairs, a narrow stairway on the side of a house? I'm trying to figure out what that conversation was like. I watched some guys bring in a, a, a refrigerator. So I talk to y'all about the straps. Y'all remember that? I was listening to them guys. Hey, no, 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 slow, slow down, slow, slow. Back up. They were talking to each other. And I'm trying to imagine what these dudes were saying to each other because when you're going up the stairs and a dude is on a mat, that ain't got no springs, it ain't, got, it ain't no posturepedic, Adjust the head up, down, let the feet. Ain't none of that. It's a flat old mat. And if they're going upstairs, that means home dude run the risk. <laughs> There's some, there was some extraordinary engineering going on here. Um, how much engineering? 
Are we willing to engage to get somebody to where Jesus is? How much energy are we exerting to get somebody to where Jesus is? Um, how much conversation and coordination are going on? I mean, how much prayer is going on? Y'all follow what I'm saying? Like, Lord, I got to get them before Jesus. I don't know what this is going to take. I hope the dude don't slide off the mat, Lord. Listen, y'all, say, oh, slow down. Because they can't drop him. Because if they drop him, they got a bigger mess. I'm saying to you that, that the precious cargo we're entrusted to carry requires our faith, and we can't drop people on the way. We, we got to be willing to go all the way. We got Listen, we got to press through the crowd if necessary. We got to go up the stairs if necessary. We got to tear some tiles. So, to, somebody said tear the roof off the sucker. <laughs> that, was, that was prophetic. <laughs> he said tear the roof off the mother sucker. <laughs> tear the roof off the sucker. And then he said, we got a real, I'm sorry. Happy thing going down, getting down. <laughs> uh, we won't. I'm sorry. <laughs> y'all stay with me. Are y'all are y'all tracking with me? This this is carrying faith. This is faith enough to carry someone. Listen, um, they had to lift them up. They refused to give up. They went higher when opposition blocked them, and they tore the tiles off the roof. That's what, listen, you can't help somebody get a breakthrough if you ain't got some breakthrough faith. You got to have some carrying faith. We got people, oh my God, help me preach up in here. You got, we got friends and loved ones who are stuck and who are looking for a breakthrough. They don't even know where to turn. But this dude says, listen, uh, I got faith enough to get on the mat. I don't care where y'all take me. I'm trying to get out of this paralysis. I'm trying to get out of this stuck place. I'm trying to get out of this. I can't move forward. I can't move backwards. I'm, I'm tired of being here like this. There are a lot of people around us who are tired of being stuck, y'all. They're tired. They're tired of being stuck in bad relationships. They're tired of being stuck financially. They're tired of being stuck in depression. They're tired of being stuck in anxiety. And, and, and we got the, let me say it this way, God will give you the strength to carry them. He, he will give us the strength to carry them. What I love about this, this carrying faith is that it's a compassionate faith. They, they couldn't see their dude in this position as long as he had been in it. And we don't know how he got there, how long he'd been. But they lie. We, bro, we can't keep seeing you like this. Come with us. You going with us. Is there anybody you said, no, 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 you come with me. You going with me. You coming with me on Sunday. You come, Easter Sunday's coming around. You coming with me. You coming out of the stuck place. You're not, we're not going to leave you in this paralysis that you're in we listen we love you too much we care about you too much listen whatever it takes we'll pick you up we'll drive you we'll call the uber we'll oh my god who am i preaching to right now somebody shout we got to do whatever it takes by any means necessary i love their carrying faith their breakthrough faith here's what i discovered stuck people need they need three things they need Friends who care enough to carry their burdens, that's compassion. Somebody said, Lord, give me compassion. Compassion means that when I see people in a stuck place, I imagine what it's like to be them. Anybody remember when you were stuck? Anybody remember when you got unstuck? How, how good did it feel to get unstuck? We see them with compassion. Uh, stuck people need faith enough to believe Jesus can change their lives. Now, we're going to talk about this man's faith because I think his faith was as potent and powerful as that of his friends because for him to let them carry that, listen, anytime your friends let you bring them to church means that they got just a little tiny bit of little mustard seed of faith that something good is going to happen to them. 
And one service, one message can change their entire eternity. Is that what happened to you and me? How many of y'all remember the day that, that your life changed, that you said yes to the Lord? Come on, give the Lord a praise for somebody who carried you to church. I've shared this story with y'all, but act like you never heard it before. Um, I got carried to church by Mama Q and them. There was a big old bus on the front of the bus, Jesus Saves. Um, the Garden of Prayer, number three. Um, the Little White, uh, well, the Garden of Prayer, number three, where prayer and praise prevails. That was their mission on the side of the bus. Now, that bus would break down some Sundays. <laughs> and Brother Rich would get off the bus and fix the bus and still get us, in, get, get us to church on time. He drove the bus. Uh, Mama Q made sure the kids in the neighborhood got on the bus. Even if their parents didn't get on the bus. Are you following what I'm saying? I'm saying people made, they made a concerted effort. I forgot that it took gas to run the bus. I ain't never get no offer in church. <laughs> I do now, but I didn't then. And, and it just occurred to me that it takes some serious effort to get people saved. It, it doesn't just happen. And, and it's, not just, um, it's not just pie in the sky. Some, somebody else is going to do it. It's, it's, it's just going to happen. It's going to happen when we express compassion. They had to have, um, the stuck people have to have friends who, who are compassionate, faith enough to believe Jesus can change their lives, and forgiveness of their own sins that frees them. See, when you prize the forgiveness of God in your life, you want other people to experience forgiveness in their lives. I think I need to teach you on forgiveness more. And the reason I'm saying that is because I think a lot of Christians live with so much guilt and shame ourselves that, that we've forgotten how much the Lord loves us and forgives us. Tell your neighbor, he forgives you. As a matter of fact, tell him he has already forgiven you. And his forgiveness is always available to us. You know what it's like to walk around stuck in guilt? I remember when I was first getting serious about God, I was a college student. And um, when I got to campus, I was torn. Anybody ever been torn? Don't, please don't look at me like that. Don't, don't, don't look at me like that. I was torn. And, and on some days, I wanted to go hard for God. On other days, I wanted to go hard otherwise. And then there were days I wanted to go hard for God. And some days I was going hard way left. And, and, I was, and I was carrying such guilt in my life that when the Bible study leader came to my house, I mean to my, my, my dorm room knocking on the door, I told him come at 645 because the meeting started at 7 just around the corner on campus. But I was carrying so much guilt and shame I said, everybody in the room. <laughs> because the shame, the guilt was so heavy. And then I got to Bible study the next week. This is amazing, isn't it? I get to Bible study the next week. Guess what they were teaching on? If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I never forgot that verse for the rest of my life. I have used it. 379 million times. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. When we know what it is to be forgiven, we get excited about others knowing God's forgiveness. Amen? Amen. Can I give you all my last faith here? So we talked about sitting faith. Tell your neighbor, don't have that. Um, carrying faith. Develop that. That's a compassionate faith. That's a caring faith. That's a faith that goes the extra mile on behalf of other people to get them to the presence of the Lord. 
The final faith I see in this text is a saving faith. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they got the sitting faith. The men carrying the man, they got carrying faith. Um, but the guy on the stretcher who lets them carry him has saving faith. He said, how do you know that? The Lord says to all of them, he says, um, um, well, well, he says, as they're carrying him, he says to him, your sins are forgiven. But the text says that he saw their faith. Tell your neighbor, he saw their faith. And Jesus could decipher between the faith of all five of them so that he could see that those who were carrying him already had saving faith and they, they had developed carrying faith. They had developed enough, enough discipleship oomph, if you will, to say we got to help people come to faith in Jesus. But they could see that the man on the mat needed forgiveness. Or rather, Jesus could see it. And he simply says, uh, son, your sins are forgiven. And some people would be like, hey, bro, we didn't bring him for forgiveness of sin. We brought him to get him up off that cot. And Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. I think that dude must have done like this. Because Jesus can see that what's going on in his life is something deeper than what's happening outside of him. And, and we have to know that at the end of the day, that there's something far deeper going on inside that may present on the outside. And sometimes we only see the outside of people's lives. And we think if we can just get you patched up, fixed up, or you're not that bad, or you're, go, you're just fine. You know, if you just get your money straight, you'll be all right. But there's something going on on the inside that is much more um, uh, difficult to render or to, 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 to resolve than what was happening on the outside. Now, the sitting faith people, um, they were mad because who is he to forgive sins? Jesus is trying to prove what Luke has been trying to prove, which is that he is the God who can forgive your sins. There is no forgiveness without Christ, apart from the shed blood of Christ. Y'all been in your Bible? God has given him the authority to forgive sins on, he on earth for humanity. There is no other name given to men by which we must be saved except the name of Jesus. There's no other way to have your sins forgiven and to be saved. I'm trying to give y'all elementary. Is this making sense to you? Jesus says, friend, your sins are forgiven. They began having a conversation within themselves and Jesus can see their negativity. He sees them um, um, uh, sort of reflecting and they're, they're like, who does this guy think he is? He can see all of that because he can see all of that. And he says to this man, your sins are forgiven. And the Bible says, Jesus simply says to him, um, you can get up, take your bed, and go on back to your house. What does saving faith look like? How do you know somebody's got saving faith? Because I'm not Jesus, you're not Jesus. How do we know? What does it look like? First of all, the man is humble enough to know he needed forgiveness. He was humble enough to let them carry him. And I'm trying to tell you, maybe you're here today, maybe you're online today, uh, you and I have to humble ourselves and be willing to be broken enough to say, I need help. Because, because if I come to church and, and my sins aren't forgiven, that means I'm subject to spend an eternity separated from God. Um, but if I'm too proud to say, Lord, I am jacked up, I am far from you, if I'm too proud to admit that, then God can't help me. I remember I was 11 years old. I knew I was, I was scared as all get out. I was scared to live in eternity without God. I thought about it every day of my life from the time I was about eight years old when my grandfather passed. Y'all follow what I'm saying? You can't get to Christ without humility. You can't be saved without humbling ourselves. Um, uh, what else does it look like? It looks like responsiveness to the word of God. This man responds to the word of God. The, the Pharisees who got sin faith, they don't, they don't respond to the word of God. The word is being preached, they're like, Yeah. 
They're not responsive. This man is responsive. How do we know he's responsive? Uh, because when the Lord tells him to get up and carry his mat, guess what he does? He gets up and carries his mat. Saving faith is transformative. It's got the power to transform your life and my life. How many of you know you're not who you used to be? You, you may not be who you're going to be, but you're not, we're not who we used to be. When you put your faith in Christ, it transforms your life. It starts on the inside with forgiveness. It begins to run up to the mind so that we start thinking the way God thinks and seeing the way God sees and hungering the way God calls us to hunger. It is transforming. And Lord, may I never forget what it was like to be changed along the way so that now I know I've been changed. I know that I'm a new man. There were places I did used to go. I don't go anymore. There are things I used to do. Thank God, Lord. Lord, thank God I don't do them anymore. I'm still jacked up sometime, but I'm not jacked up all the time. And I'm glad to have been transformed by the power of the living God. I'm thankful for the people who had carrying faith, who said, this little boy need to get to church. And if we don't get him to church, he's going to wreck something. Come on, help me talk. They said, boy, if you don't get yourself on this bus, I'm glad for Mama Q. I'm thankful for, uh, for Big Beverly. That's what we used to call in the hood. I'm thankful for all of those who used to get us on the bus, they had no idea that I would be preaching on Sunday morning in, in 2024. They had no idea that I would be giving God the praise. They had no idea that I would be loving him for the rest of my life. They had no idea that many would come to faith in Jesus because of the little boy that they made sure got on the bus. They had enough faith that God would put gas in the bus. They had enough faith that if they just got me to church, they they had enough faith that if he just heard the word, they had enough faith. They had carrying faith so that I could get to church and exercise some saving faith on a, on a warm January morning. The church felt like 150 degrees. I said, Lord, I don't want to leave this life without you. I don't know where granddaddy is, but I don't want to leave this life without you. And on that morning, I walked down the little red carpeted aisle. Preacher stood on the platform. He said, son, what brings you? I ain't say the bus brought me. I ain't say Mama Q and them. I said, I want to be saved. I want to give my life to Christ. 11 years old. That one decision changed my destiny. You say, Pastor, why are you telling us this? Because the greatest story anybody's ever going to hear is what the Lord can do for them. The most powerful thing anybody's going to experience is to put their faith in Christ and to be transformed. Somebody's going to lead the next president to Jesus. Somebody's going to lead CEOs of major corporations to Jesus. Somebody, you, you're going to bring somebody to church and, and, and you have no idea what transformation is going to come over them. 